8 verses 1 to 3. When he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing. Be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Amen. I want to use as a subject, it's going to take a miracle. It's, it's going to take a miracle. And, and, and as I thought about it's going to take a miracle, I, I wanted to discover what does the word miracle mean? What is, what is the meaning of this word miracle? And, you know, we all, uh, from the beginning, uh, would always, if you want a definition, we go to Webster. And so I went to Webster just to see what he had to say about this word miracle. And, and, and I discovered that a miracle is an extraordinary event. It's an extraordinary event, but this extraordinary event takes place in, in the physical world, if you will. And in other words, this extraordinary event that takes place in the physical world, it sort of surpasses anything that a human can do. It surpasses anything that nature can do. And so in other words, a miracle is something that only God can do. And so I thought about you. I thought about me. I thought about us. And all of us in our lives sometimes run into situations that calls for a miracle. All of us in our lives sometimes in our circumstances have circumstances that calls for a miracle. All of us have some things that it can't be fixed by man, it can't be fixed by nature, it can only be fixed by the supernatural. And the supernatural power that only God has. So in other words, there's some things and there's some situations that happen in our lives that can only be fixed by a miracle. In other words, it's just going to take a miracle. I know that sometimes we believe that we can get it done by calling our hookup, our contact, and we believe that they can do something or call somebody and make it happen. But I'll tell you, there's some things that your hookup and your contacts just can't do. And you need for God to step in and do what only God can do. I know we have some situations in our lives that we, 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 need, we need miracles because I talk to people all the time who are at their wits in and they try everything they know to try. They call everybody they know to call and none of it has solved their problems. And I know then when they get to that point, I know when I get to that point that the only thing that can help me is a miracle. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know because sometimes it takes miracles to mend broken relationships. Sometimes it, it, it takes miracles to, to fix certain financial problems. And, and it takes miracles, literally miracles, to, to reconcile struggling marriages. Sometimes it takes miracles to, 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 to rescue a wayward child. I'm telling you that sometimes only a miracle is going to come and work on your behalf. Some people are sick and you know, they are never can't figure out how they're going to get well. And the truth of the matter is the only way that they're going to get well is that it's going to take a miracle. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know there's some people who are struggling in their mind. 
when I look at the text, that Jesus really was on a, a I would say, his first leg of a miracle working tour. Because if you, if you read Matthew chapter 8 and, and Matthew chapter 9, you realize that Jesus performed 10 miracles within these chapters. But in chapter 8, Jesus healed the centurion servant, and then, then he healed Peter's mother-in-law, and then he, he healed the demon-possessed. And then the Bible says that Jesus spoke a word, and everybody who was sick was healed. And so Jesus was in the midst of working miracles. And in his miracle working tour, he ran into a brother who was a leper. What I realized is that lepers in the ancient days were the worst, that have the leprosy was the worst kind of disease that you could ever have. You see, the thing is, is that a leper, he had multiple problems. A leper had physical problems first. Because, and I want you to understand now who this brother was and, and what his problem was. So the thing is, he was a leper. And I, I, you know, I studied this thing because I was thinking, what's the big deal about this leper? And this leper, the thing about leprosy and, and, and a leper is that the leper, the first thing he does, he has these nodules on it. Just a little sore, a little. But then, the thing about these little nodules that ends up on his body, the next thing they do is they turn into, uh, they, they, they become uh, ulcerated. In other words, they become like sores with pulse dripping out of them. And so, here this leper is, who's really disgusting. Have you ever seen somebody, maybe they have one injury and they have injured themselves and they have a sore it's Paul sort of coming out of it. And you're trying to sit down and have a meal and they got some sore in their hand. You can't even eat. Now imagine though, a person who has that what I just described all over their body. And so that's a person who's a leper. And so as I kept studying this whole idea of what leprosy is and what it does to a human body, I realized that when a person has leprosy, their eyebrows come off. And then they began, as it gets worse, to stare sort of into space. And then, as it gets worse, their throat, their vocal cord become ulcerated. And if their vocal cord become ulcerated, then they can hardly talk and they sort of talk like this. Because they have these nodules in their throat and they have these ulcerated throat and it's infected in there and they can't talk. And so a person who's a leper, they can't talk. They look a mess, and the thing about it, their whole body becomes a walking sword. Every time you see them, you see disgust. You see, you see the most nastiest thing that you could ever think of. You don't want this person around. Now, that's not the worst thing, though, because the thing is, when a person becomes a leper, people treat them like a dog. As I studied this, as I studied this, I understood that their physical condition was terrible, but the way people treated them was worse. Because see, what they really say for a leper is that we want to banish you from society. They wore torn clothes because what they wanted to do was to be able to identify them from a distance. In other words, we already know that they had sores all over them, but you may not be able to tell them from a distance. So they were, they were obligated to wear ragged clothes. They were obligated to have their hair all over their head and be just show. They, they were obligated to have this thing over their lip. So they could be identified even from a distance because nobody wanted to have anything to do with this leper. And then, and then as I studied a little deeper, I realized they said that a leper really was a person who should be considered as David. Now, 
disgusting, that we're going to bury you. We, we won't have no funeral while you're still alive. And they really did that. In ancient times, a leper really was considered dead. And then I started a little deeper, and I found something out about their spiritual life. Now, I want you to really think about this. Their spiritual life was affected because in the synagogue, which you've seen synagogues, right? They're big. They're huge. But for a leper, they only gave them a little space. Uh, I think I read it was a 6 by 10, I mean, six, 10 by 6, so it was 10 feet high and 6 feet wide. Now, it's some 6 feet people in here, right? And, and they're not at the ceiling, so we know that's not our room. So a leper, no matter how many it was, all had to gather in this little 10 by 6. And that's where they did their worship. But the thing was that the priest, without the priest, but the rabbi, really didn't want to have nothing to do with the leper. The, 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 the thing that I studied said that, that the priest, I mean the rabbi, when he saw the leper, he went the other way. And so, how could then a leper be spiritually fed? If the teacher, his preacher, the one who was supposed to teach him the word of God ran from him when he saw him, went the other way when he showed up. How then was it expected for a leper to even get the word of God? Their life was a mess because nobody wanted to have anything to do with them. And I took a look at this brother, this brother, this brother. We can learn a lesson from him because he was marginalized, he was ostracized, he was dehumanized, he was devalued, but you know what? He knew how to get a miracle. And as we look at this brother who came to Jesus in need of a miracle, although he was really considered dead, although he was considered inhumane, although he was considered untouchable. And the thing about a leper, the part that I left out, is that a leper, whenever he came into the public, you know what he had to do? He had to say, unclean, unclean. If he walked in here, he had to say, unclean. Wherever there were people and a leper show up, he had to say, I'm unclean. So what that means is that all the attention went to him and everybody went this way while he had to go that way. So a leper's life was a life of absolute misery. And the only thing that could have helped a leper, it had to be a miracle. It had to be supernatural. Because nobody else, human-wise, wanted to have anything to do with him. The only person that would have anything to do with him, as we see in this text, was Jesus. And some of you, the only person that really want to have something to do with you is Jesus. Sometimes you find yourself in a position is Jesus is the only person who you can talk to. Sometimes you find yourself in a position that Jesus is the only person who understands you. Sometimes you find yourself in a position knowing that if you call on everybody you know, they wouldn't understand your situation. But if you call on the name of Jesus, he understands exactly what you're going through. Three points real quick, because I'm sweating, and I'm sure you're sweating, and I'm not going to hold you long. But as I looked at this brother, I realized that his miracle really happened because he activated the miracle himself. First point is that if you're going to receive your miracle, you must worship God. It's in the text because in verse, verse 2a, the Bible said that when the leper saw Jesus coming down out of the mountains, he came and he worshipped him. And, 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 and the thing about it was, if you're going to really get your miracle, you must understand that the beginning of you activating that miracle is you got to worship God. You remember Moses, don't you? Remember when, 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 when Moses was talking to God, and he says, well, God, who, who, do, who do I tell him sent me? And, and God says 
says to Moses, says, Moses, uh, I, I tell you, all you really have to do is tell him, I am, that I am sent you. So he didn't give himself no name, but, but he said, I am. And, and, and I am, that I am sent you. And I thought about it. If, if I am, and God is I am, it says to me, whatever I need from God, he is. Oh, yeah, I think, I think y'all didn't understand what I said, but let, let me put it like this. If you need a healing, God is. If you need a provider, God is. If, if you need a situation mended and fixed, God is. If you need reconciliation in some situation, God is. If you need a counselor, God is. If you need a deliverer, God is. And so whatever it is that you need in your miracle-seeking reality, God is. So you worship God because God is the one who can perform the miracle. You activate it. He performs it. But you got to activate it by worshiping him. He's worthy of your worship. He, he's worthy of your worship because it's the worthiness of God that allows him to be the great I am. And so the first thing then, if you're going to receive your miracle, the first thing you have to do is worship God. And then next, told you I was going to fast today, fast today. Second point, you worship God. And the next thing is I watched this brother here for him, in order for him to receive his miracle and in order for you to receive your miracle, the second thing you have to do is you got to ask God for help. In the same verse, but the B part of it, the leper says to Jesus, Lord, if you are willing. And so the leper posed a question to God. He said, now, Jesus, are you willing to heal me? Lord, are you are willing to make me better? And then I, 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 I looked as I was in my Bible just across the way in Matthew 7, verse 7, and the Bible said, ask and it will be given unto you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. And in verse 8, the Bible says, everyone who asks shall receive. And so if you want something from God, if you want a miracle to take place in your life, you must ask God. You can't just think, oh, it's going to happen because I'm so good. I I'm so special. No, it's not going to happen until you ask for it. And so, listen, the confidence that we have then in God is that if we ask God, he's going to hear our prayers and he's going to answer our prayers. And so if we really want our miracle to happen, if we ask and it's according to his will, he's going to answer it. And so your miracle then is joys for the asking. So maybe you have not because you've asked not. If you want a miracle, you got to ask for the miracle. You can't just think it's going to happen. The leper said, Jesus, if you will. Third point, and I'm moving on along, is that if you really want a miracle, and this brother right here, it didn't take much for him to show us about himself because I only did three verses of this text. And the next thing I see in verse 2, point C, is that the leper says to Jesus, you can make me clean. So if you want your miracle, you must believe God can help you. Look, when he said, when he said, to, when he said to Jesus, you can make me clean, it was an indication to me that he believed that Jesus could heal him. Because he wouldn't have said it like that. He, he knew that, 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 that Jesus had the power, if you will. He, but he, and he believed it. See, sometimes, y'all, you don't get your miracle because you don't even believe that you're going to get it yourself. In other words, you need to move doubt out of the way and open up the avenues of faith and belief so God can work a miracle in your life. Listen, you got to believe some things about God. You got to know that God cares enough about you, that he won't want you to suffer. You got to know that God knows every single thing that you're going through. 
and that he don't want his children. If you are in his will, you don't have to worry about it. I promise you, if you get in the will of God and you do the things that he's calling you to do and you get in his steps and let him order your steps, if you ask him in the name of Jesus for exactly what you want and believe it in your heart that he will answer your prayer, I promise you, you will see the answer come to you. See, that's the thing, see. People half-heartedly ask, oh, God, if you just, if you can, if you will, I, I, I need. No, 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 no. It can't be like that. You got to believe before you ask. In other words, you got to call for those things to be not as though they were. You got to say, I know if I ask God, he's going to answer my prayer. And so you have to believe some things about God. And I, I thought about it, that, 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 you know, sometimes we get so little because we believe so little. Listen, 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 listen. We have to believe as believers that God can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ever ask or think. And so in other words, after you finish asking, he can do more than that. See, what happens to us is we ask for so little, and, and, if, we, and if God only just gives us the little bit that we ask for, we have very little. But if we ask him and believe that he will, we can get all that we, we, we no, 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 I, I take that back. We can get more. We can get more than we think that we deserve. And, you know, you have to believe that. Because when we start believing that about God, we have to start believing that, that God will never leave us or forsake us. We have to believe it. We have to believe it because the thing about it is, if you don't believe it, you feel alone. If you believe God will leave you, if you believe God will forsake, forsake you, you feel alone. But if you believe that God will never leave you or forsake you, you will always have at least one person as your companion. Listen, loneliness shouldn't be a part of a Christian's life. If we believe in God, we should never feel alone. We may not have no people around. We may not have a crowd around. But if we got Jesus around, and we got to believe he's there. Listen, I've learned a lot about people. People oftentimes are afraid to be by themselves. They're afraid to be alone. And you know, I, I realize, too, that sometimes people are afraid to be alone, so they accept any old thing. Let me say that again. It's, it's, it's oftentimes people's fear of being alone that they accept and put up with any old thing. But if you believe that the God that you serve will never leave you or forsake you, you know you are never alone. And, and if that's the case, then you won't put up with any old thing. All you want in companionship is with God. And if you got God as your companion, you don't have to worry about nobody else, nothing else. Because if God is with you, he's greater than the world against you. And so you can always stand and know and believe that God, in his way of being with us and occupying our time and occupying our mind and occupying our spirit, he never leaves us. But we got to believe that. And you know, you got to believe these things about God because once you start believing these things about God, it becomes a reality of who God is to you. And you know, I was thinking about it, how sometimes people get so caught up and worried about their finances and worried about all this stuff. But you know, you got to believe this about God. You got to believe that one day God's going to make you the lender, not the borrower. You got to believe that. You, you, you got to one day, you got to believe that one day God's going to make you the head not to tell. You got to believe it. Look, 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 look. You got to believe that God is going to make your latter days so much greater than your first days. If you believe that about God, you will quit worrying about your money. You got to believe it about God. Because if you believe it about God, you will see the miracle working power of God working in your life. It's going to take a miracle in some of your situations. It's going to take a miracle in some of your circumstances. It's just going to take a miracle. But if you believe God to work out that miracle in your life, 
You believe God that he will deliver. You got to believe God. Because the only way you see that miracle is that you got to believe he's going to work the miracle. You can't receive what you don't see. Let me say that again. If you don't see it for yourself, if you don't believe it for yourself, you will never receive it for yourself. Hear what I'm trying to tell you now. You got to believe it for yourself. And when you do that, you will receive it for yourself. And I just want to finish up this sermon. And I want to just take a good look at this brother. Because nobody in here situation was worse than his. If you, think it's, if you think it is, look at him. You're not ostracized. You're not marginalized to that degree. You don't have sores all over your body. You can come to church and worship. You're not in a 10 by 6. You're in the sanctuary. So your situation is nothing like this, brothers. But when I look at this brother, after he had worshiped God, after he had asked God for his miracle, after he had believed God for his miracle, if you look in the text, the Bible said that Jesus reached out his hand and touched this brother within itself. But Jesus just touched him. That was in the Jewish faith was wrong because, listen, he was really labeled as unclean. Nothing that was top that was a dead person. So you don't touch a dead person, and the next in line for that was a leper. So Jesus touched a man who really was considered dead, who was unclean. And, and the Bible said that Jesus said, yes, I am willing. And when he said, I am willing, he said, be cleansed. And then the Bible said, "Woo!" The Bible said, immediately his leopard was cleansed. And so in other words, immediately this brother was healed, this brother was made whole, this brother was delivered, this brother was set free. This brother, after he worshiped God, after he asked God, after he believed in God, this brother received his miracle. And so I'm telling you now, there's somebody in here today who's in search of a miracle, who's wanting a miracle, who needs a miracle, but you haven't received it yet. Maybe, just maybe, if you decide to begin to worship God for who he is, maybe, just maybe, if you decide to ask God with belief that he can do it and he will do it, you'll receive your miracle. Because I'm going to tell you right now, brothers and sisters, there are some things in life that you can only receive if God works a miracle in that life of yours. And so I want you to right now, when you leave here today, I want you to leave believing that God can work a miracle in your life. No matter what your circumstances, no matter what your situation, no matter what, God has the power to work miracles. God has the power to make something out of nothing. God has the power to lift you up when you're down. God has the power to strengthen you when you're weak. God has the power to feed you when you're hungry. God has the power to deliver you when you've been captured. God has the power. And if you allow God to work his miracle working power in your life, I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, you won't be disappointed. God wants to work a miracle in your life. But he needs for you to activate the miracle. It's just like you go to AT&T. You buy your iPhone. And you can get it in a brand new box and take it home and take it out and turn it on. But until you call AT&T and say, I need to activate this phone, all you have is a phone. Well, if you're in need of a miracle, until you worship God, until you ask God, until you believe in God, all you have is a need. 
But if you want the need met, you better activate that miracle so God can meet your need. And so I want you to understand something. God is still in the miracle working business. And you are entitled to a miracle. But you have to activate the miracle in your own life. You can't depend on your mama. You can't depend on your daddy. You can't depend on your sister. You can't depend on your brother. You can't depend on your husband. You can't depend on your wife. You can only depend on you and God making that miracle making connection. So you, as we stand to our feet, are in need of a miracle. It's going to take a miracle. But you and God together can bring that miracle to pass.